right, now we're going to look at transmission zeros of systems. We're going to start off looking at the case of non-square systems. So recall that H of S has a transmission zero, lambda, if there's a non-zero vector V such that H of lambda times V is equal to zero. And, and so this is a, a, a right null space. This is a left null, null space vector. Okay, so there will always be a right-hand vector and a left-hand and a non-zero left-hand vector. So we'll, we will always have that. So the reason we say this is because look, if we look at a matrix like this, this has more inputs than outputs. And so I can show that this vector um, makes g of s times v of s equals zero for any value of s. Okay. So it, for any value of s, this will, this will, however, the matrix itself does not dro drop rank at any real value of s. So basically what this, this says is when you have more uh, or different number of inputs and outputs, you can always find non-zero vectors in the, in the non-trivial non-zero vectors in the null space uh, of, of the matrix. Okay. So... Since it's true for any S, that means I have an S's everywhere. Okay, and it's so, so in that case, the uh, the definition of a zero is is non-trivial. I mean, is is trivial, and so we're concerned with the case when we when we have um, w when we have a non-zero vector multiplying both sides. So if we compute g of S times g of S transpose determinant set that equal to zero, we find this polynomial. Um, and the roots of this polynomial will make the matrix lose rank. In general, these roots are complex. So for example, this vector is such that g of s uh, times v is equal to zero for a particular value of s. That is a root of this polynomial. But this matrix does not drop rank for, any for just any value of s. So in general, the typical minimal realization um, zeros of a, uh, the transmission zeros are the typical minimum realization zeros of a multi-input, multi-output system. For square systems, poles and zeros are the poles and zeros of the determinant of G of S. I'm sorry, the poles of the system are the roots of determinant of G of S. I'm sorry. The poles and zeros are the poles and zeros of the determinant of G of S if you have a square system. Yes. So th that this statement is correct. I was reading it incorrectly. But the method can fail when zeros and poles are different, are from different parts of the system and cancel because of their directions. So we saw an example of that earlier. In general, for square systems, the number of poles equals the number of zeros. Zeros usually appear when there are fewer inputs or outputs than states. You get extra zeros that can appear. Invariant zero is also known as an input or output decoupling zero. It is often due to a non-minimal realization of the system. It can be associated with unobservable or uncontrollable states and can be avoided by finding a minimal realization of the system before determining system zeros. In general, we'll have transmission zeros plus invariant zeros is equal to system zeros. Now, we've talked a little bit when we talked about the, um, the um, matrix fraction description, we talked about something called a unimodular matrix. And we recall that a unimodular matrix is a matrix that is a function, is a polynomial matrix. That is, the elements are polynomials. Notice that zero is a polynomial with all zero coefficients. One is a polynomial with one as a constant coefficient and zero as all the other coefficients and so forth. So this is a polynomial. The determinant of this uh, polynomial matrix is one. The determinant of this polynomial matrix will not be zero as long as A is not equal to B. Then I will have a constant determinant for this matrix. So the Smith-McMillan form 
of a transfer function matrix is a diagonalized form of a transfer function matrix. It is actually a particular form of diagonal form of the transfer function matrix, but it is a diagonal form. So in general, um, in this case, I am considering the system having um, more outputs than inputs, non-square, more outputs than inputs. So if we can use unimodular matrices on the right and the left of our transfer function matrix to make this matrix di diagonal. That is, it's diagonal and then all zeros down below. Okay, and so, so in general we will have this uh, where the, po the polynomials n1, d1, and so forth are um, relatively prime with respect to each other. That is, no pole zero cancellations. So we can always do this in the, what's called a smith mclaurin form. So having done this then, the transmission zeros are the roots of the, the product n1 through nm. The poles of the system are the roots of d1 through dm, the pro this product. And so we have those poles and zeros. So if you can get the system into smith mcmillan form, then you can easily read off the transmission zeros and the poles of the system. So to find the smith mcmillan form, we would basically find the least common denominator of all the denominators within the entire transfer function matrix. Then we would form, um, we would form um, P of S from this expression. Uh, P, G of S would be P of S divided by D of S. So that is P of S can be written as G of S times D of S. When we do that, we will get a polynomial matrix. Okay. Um, <clears throat> by using unimodular row and column operations, we can diagonalize the matrix P of S. Then we can divide the diagonal entries in to obtain the smith mcmillan form and then read off the poles and zeros. In general, we will need to sort, uh, we will need to sort the, the, pole, the elements along the diagonal if we want to get it in a true smith mcmillan form. So, that, that is how we would do the smith mcmillan form. Now, what happens if we have a system that's in diagonal form? So suppose we've diagonalized a system, that is, lambda is diagonal, and uh, we've done a similarity transformation so that we have this. So suppose that we have that, where lambda is diagonal. Okay, And so we have now what are called structural properties of the modal system. So we have these rows, B, B1 through Bn, and these columns, C1 through Cn. Okay, And each row is associated with an eigenvalue. And this matrix is diagonal. So this obviously does not apply to uh, matrices that require a Jordan form, defective matrices. Um, so if any row is, uh, in this matrix is 0, uh, then the system is not controllable. Similarly, if any column in this matrix is zero, system is not observable. Okay, so what happens if we have an unobservable system? That is, if one of these columns is zero. Okay, so if I look at this quantity now, so this is again a similarity transformation on our system, but we've seen that a similarity transformation does not change poles or zeros. It, it merely re rearranges the internal coordinates. All right, so so we have this, and in, in our particular case, we don't have a D matrix, or our, rather our D matrix is zero. So when we look here, if we take a vector of this form, which is not zero, okay, and multiply it by this by, through by this matrix, I get this quantity, which is equal to zero. And what is this saying? Um, so this, this quantity here, um, is, is the, is a, so this is a diagonal matrix with lambdas along the diagonal. This is also a diagonal matrix. And instead of having all the eigenvalues along the diagonal, it has just the one eigenvalue, lambda i, along the diagonal. And so you can see that in the ith location, in the ith location, 
I'll have a lambda i in this matrix and a lambda i in this matrix that will subtract and leave a zero at that point along the diagonal. And now I'm multiplying by identity matrix that has all zeros and a one at that exact same location. And so when I multiply this together, I will get zero. And similarly, this matrix C tilde has this column equal to zero. So when I take this column times this row, I'm sorry, this column is equal to zero. So this matrix has a zero column in it that corresponds with the non-zero element of this uh, vector, this column. And so when I multiply these two together, I get zero. So this shows that we have an in, that lambda i is an invariant zero, and here is our this this gives our direction. Okay. So when we have an invariant zero, for, if we have an unobservable system, we have an invariant zero. Uh, associated with that system. In the event that we have a, a row in the B matrix that's equal to zero, if I multiply this matrix on the left by this row, this is a non-zero row, I get this expression. Again, this matrix is going to be as, as going to have lambdas along the diagonal, lambda minus little lambda, lambda i along the diagonal, and at the ith location I'll have a zero. With this when I multiply by this row of the identity, I will get, times this, I will get zero. Similarly, this row of the identity times this matrix that has this, uh, this row equals zero is going to pick off that row giving zero. So all of this is equal to zero. And so we see that lambda i is an invariant zero associated with this direction, this direction coming from the left. So, in terms of zeros overall, nz is the number of zeros. nz is less than or equal to this quantity, the, the, the number of states minus the maximum of the inputs, number of inputs and outputs if d is zero. The number of zeros is less than or equal to n if d is not zero. The number of zeros is less than or equal to n minus m minus d if d is equal to zero, m is equal to p, and d is, little d is the rank deficiency of this product CB. Okay, so we have those relationships between the number of zeros and the number of states, the number of inputs and outputs, and the, the relationship of C and B to all of this. So what happens if we change our system? So in this case I'm assuming that I have more outputs than inputs. So if S is a zero of this matrix, okay, of the system of this form, then it will also be a zero of a system of this form. Okay, so the reason I chose P greater than or equal to M is because um, that means I have a left vector that's going to be that's going to imply the um, the uh, zero of this, uh, the the direction for the zero of this. And you can use that same vector to generate a vector that is the left zero of this. In terms of squaring up, so in this case, this is called squaring down, this is called squaring up. Um, so if S is a zero of this matrix, notice that I've introduced a G here, then it, that will imply that it's a, it's a zero of this matrix. So if it's a zero of this system, it's automatically a zero of this system. It doesn't necessarily mean the other way around. It, it doesn't necessarily mean a zero of this system is a zero of this system. Static state feedback. So, or static output feedback. So, if S is a zero of this system, you can go through and show that it's also a system of this, a zero of this system for any value of K. So, notice that's related to this, but it, um, it also has this additional term associated with it. So we can alter the system and, and have zeros. And, and you can go through and prove these relationships. So in general, in terms of moving zeros, zeros are unaffected by feedback in general. Feedback can be used to shift a right half plane zero to a desired output channel. That, that is, it will not eliminate 
the right half plane zero, it allows you to shift the zero. Series compensation can be used to cancel left half plane zeros. Okay, you wouldn't want to use it to cancel right half plane zeros. A parallel compensation can be used to move zeros. Okay, but it moves zeros of the parallel combination. It doesn't move zeros of the original system. So basically, the parallel compensation works on a physical output by adding an additional input, an act, another actuator. So that's actually what's happening here. So we have some things that can happen with zeros. And uh, so this is the story of multivariable poles and zeros. Stay tuned now for the practice problems. Thank you.